everyone. Uh, my name's Sam. It's a pleasure to be talking with you all here today. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about um, what the Dartrix is doing uh, around cybersecurity and relate that specifically uh, to what we see kind of as the future of cybersecurity and, and cybercrime. Can I just, before we kick things off, just by way of a quick show of hands, can I ask who here today has heard of Dartrace prior to our stand being over there and my colleagues? And, that's pretty big guess, but can everyone hear me? Do I need it on? Like, <laughs> got more mics than like a Queen concert. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Um, that good? Yes. There we go. Yeah, let's try that. Okay. okay. Not sure if that's better or worse, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll go for it anyway. Um, yeah. So. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the changes that we might expect to see um, to cybersecurity and indeed cybercrime in the face of ever more widespread, pervasive and improving um, machine learning and automation, or the basis of AI as you might think of it. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of take us on a bit of a journey through this. Um, I want to sort of go with me on this. We're going to sort of posit a kind of AI supercharged mega evil corporation and talk about some of the ways that they might leverage AI to steal data and do very nasty and bad things with it. Um, <laughs> talk about that a bit if you want. Um, lots of things to say on that. Um, uh, yeah, think of a Cambridge Analytica on steroids. Um, uh, but then also sort of counterpoint that by saying that some of the techniques of these this kind of posited evil AI hypothetical corporation might be using uh, can actually be used against them, perhaps more successfully indeed. Um, and to sort of kick this conversation off, I'm going to, I, I want to sort of preface this by saying that I, I take this, the two premises to be quite uncontroversially true, right? Um, so most people in the room would disagree with me um, when we say that, you know, the rise of AI, if you, if you like, will, will massively fundamentally transform when we think about digital attack and defense. Um, we already see this in cybersecurity, so I don't see any reason to su su suggest that that might be changing anytime soon. Um, and fundamentally, this change will affect all participants of the internet. That's all citizens of the internet, supply chains, technologies, the way that we actually think about work, uh, the systems that we use, all of this will be transformed by AI. So before we get into the weeds of that and, and dig up some of those, those principles, I just want to sort of take a step back a little bit and talk a little bit about complexity. So complexity in our digital businesses is a, a genuine fascination of mine. Um, if you walk into any firm of size and in Britain or indeed around the world, you'll be instantly reminded of the richness, complexity uh, and the uniqueness that we find within our digital organisations. Um, there are no two patterns are the same, uh, every single one looks different um, and there are you know, obviously very well founded economical reasons for that. You want to stress your ingenuity or you sell different or differentiated products. Um, the issue with that, uh, from a security perspective, is that well, human-led is uh, that um, it's a nightmare for trying to think about securing those environments. There's no commonality between them. Um, it's very difficult to th conceptualise and think in terms of a sort of generalised structure that will work for even an industry um, with this much uniqueness and, and sort of uh, an individual footprint, if you will. So human-led approaches really, really struggle for this, and there's some very good reasons for why that might be, right? Generally speaking, computerized defenses are very specific. Um, they've tended to focus on a specific sector or problem, NAC solutions, for instance, or data loss prevention. Um, they, don't, they don't generally scale very well, um, and that's, those are the tools we're using or have been using very heavily to, to, to shore up our, our, our defenses, if you like. Um, there's a couple of other things around that as well. So if we think about um, just companies and the way they work, you know, we always know that execs and the latest teams want the newest and flashiest toys, but at the same time, businesses and enterprises suffer from inertia, right? So thinking about layering procedures and policies and layering security onto these new toys that the CTO suddenly got to play with is usually an afterthought, right? And there's a gap there. Um, so all of these things kind of combined to generally make one massive headache for your average security professional today. Um, you are asking our security teams uh, to sort of conceptualize um, the, the, all the bad that could happen and, and afflict their incredibly unique organisation to understand all of that uniqueness uh, and then come up somehow with a whole raft of solutions or policies that I mean, solutions probably don't exist or policies that haven't even considered yet to try and go about shoring that house up. Unsurprisingly, that's very difficult, borderline impossible. 
Um, and that's why we're kind of in the situation we're in today. So, unsurprisingly, um, I'm of the view that uh, the age of AI is imminent, really. Um, why? Because fundamentally, AI is a tool to help us deal with complexity. Um, the data sets get larger, um, there's more and more uniqueness, it's kind of exponential in many respects. Um, so we need more and more machines to take the burden off of our humans, right? We need the data to be forming, informing them to how to make proper, correct decisions rather than relying on them to be the instigators of that choice. Um, so I, I fun, I fundamentally I believe that the age of AI is coming, not because the attackers are so much smarter than us or because they've got lots of places to attack, in some cases, both of those are true, but the main problem is that, that complexity. The main issue is that we have an overwhelming amount of stuff and to, to try and defend and to think and how to think about we do that. Um, and that's why I think the AI is going to sort of take over how we think about cybercrime and indeed cybersecurity. I'm going to take you on that little journey now, as I explained, and sort of talk through um, and arrive at uh, what I sort of envisage as a kind of, a, a sort of masterful uh, um, almost omnipotent, you know, terrifying, cartoonishly evil, uh, science fiction-esque corporation that can harvest all your data and sell it on to the highest bidder. Um, and I'm sort of, again, yeah, <laughs> second time. I didn't even do this, right? Just, um, and uh, yeah, exactly, and just sort of, you know, it's a great, perfectly timed because, you know, one could argue it's actually already here. Uh, not relation to Facebook, but just generally. Um, the techniques and the, the tool set is fundamentally inherent Heavily exists already. So to go back to basics, um, we're all used to this, right? This is our kind of <laughs> spear fishing in the old days, right? And I'm using this example for a very specific reason because I do fundamentally believe that um, regardless of you know, the, how the attack vector will develop, fundamentally the most successful attacks will still be sort of like personalized, um, human-led, right? Okay, so someone's going to try and make someone do something that they shouldn't, right? Even the most hardened data center in the world still has a human administering it, right? So making someone do something they, th that they wouldn't have done previously is fundamentally still going to be the best way, even in, a, in an AI-led world, to do bad stuff and for the attackers to do something to achieve their aim. So this example is, you know, it's obviously pretty, <laughs> we're, we're, for everyone in this room is pretty well across this sort of thing, you know, Nigerian princes asking for, $250,000 or someone looking for love, um, that's pretty well across that, right? And we've gotten used to that, right? You know, it's not particularly clever. Uh, it's very human-led. Uh, it's, it's one person to another person. And there's no real sort of mission or aim there. It's kind of anyone who would take the bait, right? So now if we sort of build that out and go one step further, uh, and we start to think about uh, value or targets of value, people who might actually be worth it. So dedicated, sophisticating spear phishing attacks. So this is a genuine email that I received uh, from our director of training, whose name is Matt, uh, and who was doing work with another colleague called Simon at the time, um, asking me to basically enable macros uh, on a document. Um, it's very good. It's one of the best ones I've ever seen, actually. It's very, very good. They even managed to match his, his kind of the way that he sort of, um, sort of phrases things slightly. Um, the, way, the thing that caught him out, though, was actually it's too polite. <laughs> um, Matt's nowhere near as nice to me as that, normally. Um, much harsher. Um, but it was still very good, uh, and one of the, definitely one of the best ones I've ever seen. Um, the trouble with this, although potentially has the you know, power to disrupt someone, uh, a target of value, is that, is that it, that singular part, target. I might be worth it in some capacity, um, but it's not really a scalable solution, right? It's not really a clever means to go about sort of pilfering data out of my organization left, right, and center. Um, so let's build it up. Let's go one step further. Um, let's say you've got a piece of malware on your machine uh, that has access to your calendar invites, Slack, messaging apps, something like that, whatever, what have you, uh, that can understand the context and your communication styles uh, with different individuals, uh, and is able to sort of pull that data together uh, to spread itself, right? So if, let's say, for instance, we're trying to arrange a meeting, go for a coffee, and it sends a, a link that's got a, a, a dodgy uh, Google Maps uh, uh, you know, attachment to it. You open it up, think it's completely normal, uh, and then you go, it's, pr it's proliferated and spread itself. Um, same principle for editing a document. It makes a tiny edit that you then approve. Why am I going to accept all this? Because it's from a, someone that I know to be working with, that's from a, a known uh, email address, from a trusted machine. Um, it's someone from the inside, right? Um, and that's why I think that the sort of AI-powered spear phishing is going to be the most dangerous thing for us in the future. 
because uh, it looks legitimate fundamentally. It's coming from a real host name, from a real user, notionally, uh, and from a real account, right? So these things are, these, these, you know, it's, it's highly likely that people are going to are going to fall foul of this, particularly if it's got a, a good replication mechanism, isn't it? And it's able to, to spread itself through the organisation. No longer is this human-led. We're using those those sort of that sort of you know, AI, if you like, to help do the spreading part as well. Let's go one step further. <clears throat> um, let's say, for instance, that you know we're trying to understand the contents of how we might actually communicate. So it's not just enough to send out a load of dodgy Gmail links. Uh, we actually want to understand how those people talk to one another on those messaging apps that we already have managed to get an angle in and a foothold onto. Um, this is a course you could take back in 2016. I'm not sure if it's still active now, but this is a course you could actually take from Stanford University uh, on natural language processing. Um, so this is something you can do right now. There is no barrier to entry. There no one, no, no real sort of particular skill level is required to do that sort of relation of those data points around how we process language. This is not even a final year course, by the way. This is a second year course. So this is absolutely possible. So let's say we now our malware in this scenario now understands our communication style as well as having access to all of our contacts and a means to replicate itself. We'll go one step further. This company called Anyline, um, it's not an advert for them by the way, um, they are able to do text uh, recognition based on just a few milliseconds of footage um, for, for anything really. Um, and this kind of ambient data theft, if you like, is going to become more and more pervasive, I think, as we, as we grow things out. Um, with plenty of stories, even with our own company, of, of people who have, have sort of overheard conversations perhaps they shouldn't have done, or, um, or you know, or deliberately trying to like you know seek information that they wouldn't have otherwise had access to. Uh, and this is just the next step on that process, right? You know, we've got technologies out there that enable us to just you know get a small snapshot of text, uh, uh, you know, a password or a credential or, or even just a name of a company, uh, and use that to your other advantage. If we pair this with some of the techniques we were talking about earlier, particularly with regards to our communication style, we might even be able to understand contextually sensitive terms about it, deal bad, or bank account changed, or whatever it may be. Um, so there's some of those natural language processing comes into it there, and you can pair those te te technologies together uh, to create something you know, particularly powerful. The same will happen with audio as well, by the way. You know, we're any sort of walk around central London, everyone's on their phone all the time. It's not too hard in an age of ambient data theft to think that this kind of technique will be deployed to audio as well as text-based visual, right? Just ping out an MP3 file and send it to Evil Core HQ. Go one step further. Um, so again, it's a technology that's actually available uh, uh, through the App Store right now, I believe, um, that uh, essentially is doing sort of facial recognition technology. So if you think you've got a foothold in a company that manages security cameras, for instance, or generally speaking, a large IoT network, um, you, can, again, you can feed this data into your ambient data theft already and actually track people's movements, right? So you can plan your operation a bit more sophisticatedly. You know, to intercept them at the airport when they land in Geneva, you might be able to talk about their, you know, uh, sort of from insert their, their coughing the way through and you know, bump shoulders and exchange papers or whatever it may be. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you could do with that when you're essentially able to you know, passively understand where these people are, actually are in the world, right? Um, and if we pull all that together, if we you know, draw all those things together, um, I'll talk about that in a second, actually. Uh, we have a, a really, all the ingredients, if you like, for a really terrifying, supercharged, AI, malicious, evil corporation, right? And I don't think it's that far away. It sounds a bit science fiction, a bit cartoonishly evil when I say it, but, but as some of the gentlemen in this very room have pointed out, we have to have the building blocks for that right now, right? Um, there are a whole terrifying array of possibilities of things that people could do with this data that aren't just this standard blackmail, right? One US author of ransomware a couple of years ago made about 120 odd million US dollars. I think that's small fry, relatively. I think we can do a lot better than that. Um, I think there's plenty of ground and a, pretty much a safari, actually, for the, for the cyber attacker. So let's go, back, let's go the other way now. Um, we understand that you know, these techniques are out there and how they could be leveraged uh, by the criminals. But I actually think that in the long run, these techniques will actually benefit the defenders more. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, so just as a by way of a for instance, uh, just to sort of, again, sort of throw some colour on the realness of this kind of thing. So the company I work for, Darktrace, uh, did a deployment um, a couple of years ago now with a law firm who, it transpired, were broadcasting 
uh, a live 24 hour day feed of all the activity in their boardroom, both audio and visual, for two weeks. Um, they were doing this uh, from compromise or video conferencing equipment, so both the audio and the visual function of that had been, had been compromised. Um, Data Research was able to detect this through a shift in sort of, you know, the learned normal essentially. It was the only machine that was communicating externally via Telnet um, and the only machine that was going to this particular external IP. Uh, so pretty bread and butter stuff for, for Data Trace, but, but obviously something that the company set the question had no idea about. That's hugely commercially sensitive information that was essentially being live broadcast. Um, two weeks is an awfully long time, especially in, the, in our organisation. The, the sort of war room is active on a minute by minute basis. So this is, you know, potentially business ending, right? Um, and this is, you know, without some of those sort of more sort of wild, you know, wild quote unquote, more sophisticated means of actually, you know, harvesting that data and thinking about how we might do interesting, commercially damaging things with it. So I did promise to talk about the opposite end of this. Um, and this is happening right now as well. So this is not myth, this is not fiction. Um, uh, we, can, we, are, can, we are leveraging AI right now uh, to do the defense bit of this, of this sort of setup. Um, and how we do that essentially is by using that uniqueness and that complexity against those bad guys, right? Um, so if you think of your average organization, right, um, in, a net, in a sort of network, networking capability, if you have a machine or a box, something like that, that can plug into the core and understand all of those interactions, who talks with what, when, over what port, at what destination, over what time, um, you're able to build up a pattern of life for the, for the organization, right? It's completely bespoke to that, to that environment. There's nothing else like it. It doesn't correlate with someone who's in the same sector. It's completely unique. And then from that learned normal, you're able to very easily spot deviations and anomalies away from that learned pattern. Deviations and anomalies which are in many respects, deep, you know, indicative of compromise. So essentially we can use that complexity and leverage that, that innate uniqueness against the attacker because the attacker is never going to be able to understand it to the same level. It's never going to know the complete ins and outs and all those little idiosyncrasies that exist between devices, between users, between hierarchies or between servers, whatever it may be. Um, so that when the attacker comes to town and starts trying to do some of the things we just talked about and those you know, weird and wonderful means of data exfiltration, they're going to come unstuck because they're too noisy, right? They do something that, that, that is just outside of the learned normal for this very unique organization. So again, this is not myth, this is not fantasy. Now, the company that I work for, Data has been doing this for some years now. Uh, if anyone's interested in having a chat with some of my wonderful colleagues out there, at the end of this about that, they are more than welcome to. Um, I think I'm going to probably wrap up there.